everyone. Um, we're just going to make a start. My name is Judith Orr. I'm in the SWP here in London. And uh, looking forward to today's unusual, um, unusual talk from Michael Roberts. Michael Roberts, many of you will know, is a Marxist economist. He worked in the city of London for over 30 years as a financial economist and has written many books some of which at the back there, the Great Depression back in 2009, the Long Depression in just a couple of years ago, and then a new one to mark Marx's 200th anniversary, um, which is on sale in the back of the room afterwards, and in bookmarks over in Student Central. And what we're going to have, and there's a new book coming out in October as well, which we'll be look forward to, which is empirical evidence, it's a collection of writing, uh, empirical evidence on the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. So, I think that looks like an interesting one to look forward to. And I'm sure many of you will be followers of um, Michael's blog, uh, The Next Recession, and that's, if you haven't already, I really recommend looking that up. But I said this is unusual. What we've got today is Marx's Three Laws of Motion in 30 minutes. So 10 minutes for each one. I've been told to be very tight. Um, and so I will waste no more of your time. And I'll we'll talk about it. Just be hands up for if you'd like to make a contribution or ask a question in the discussion afterwards, and Michael will come back at the end. So, I hand over to you, Michael. Please give him a warm welcome. It's great pleasure to have you. Stand over here so that I can change the uh, charts, and uh, I don't want you to press the button until I'm quite ready. Um, can you because, hear that? Can you hear that? Is that okay? okay. Yeah. Um, um, it's a bit of an experiment, this. Uh, and you're the guinea pigs. Uh, and if it goes wrong, then Mr. Pavlov here will try another occasion to see if he can give a better response. Um, but the aim of this is to, in this book, Marx 200, I decided that we can boil down the whole of Marx's economic law theory down to three laws of motion, just like that. If throw the rest out, just these uh, three laws of motion. Of course, um, I'm able to say this in secret to you, and you won't let anybody else know that that's obviously a travesty of, of Marx's economics. But uh, I'm trying to do this in the three laws, and so I thought, well, let's see if I can do all three laws in 30 minutes with 10 minutes each. And the reason that inspired me to do this, but I'm not pressed yet, uh, is that uh, I was watching a uh, short 10-minute vi video at the School of Management in Cranston. Cranfield School of Management actually trains army officers and other senior executives in all sorts of management, and including economics. And the professor or doctor at the management of Cranfield did a little video. He got his friend to come on and say, well, let's do Marx's law of probability. <coughs> oh, I think I can do that in 10 minutes, he said. And he went bam, bam, bam. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the video. It's very good. And he said, well, there you go. Purists may laugh, but that's the Marxist law of profitability. And I thought, well, if he can do that, maybe I should give it a go, and also the other laws, and bring the whole thing together in a, in a, in a combined view about the three laws of motion. And the three laws of motion are Marx's law of value, Marx's law of accumulation of capital, and Marx's law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Or as I shorthanded to Marx's law of profitability, which produces groans of complaints from the purists when I do this. But nevertheless, those are the three laws. And so I'm going to give them each ten minutes. The first law is by far the most difficult, and I'm sure Judith's buffer will go before we finish that. Uh, hopefully I can actually catch up on the other two uh, in order to do the 30 minutes. So I think I'm ready to go, uh, Judith. Okay, start what starts. Okay, so Marx's law of value. Well, the first thing to say is what Marx said to Kugelman in 1868. Every child knows a nation which ceased to work. I will not say for a year, but even for a few weeks would perish. So every child knows that the masses of products corresponding to different needs require different and quantitatively termed masses of total labour of value. Uh, total labour in society. So, so science, science consists precisely of demonstrating how the law of value asserts itself. So in other words, if people don't, human beings don't work, don't labour, there is no value. It's a very simple concept to start with. The question, as he says, is precisely to demonstrate how that law of value, namely the value comes from human labour's 
energy expenditure and production, how it asserts itself on the capitalist uh, mode of production. Uh, so we but uh, I want to jump back and say, when we look in the papers every day, we see that all these companies making lots of profit. Uh, so the question really is, where does this profit come from? Because the law of value says that human labour creates value, but it doesn't, at that level, explain to us where profit comes from. Where the, the extra profit, that it seems that uh, extra value that uh, ca capitalist companies make out of production. Where does that come from? Well, um, it certainly doesn't come from fair exchange. If I've got a uh, pair of shoes for you to buy from me for uh, £100, my shoes are quite expensive, uh, uh, and you give me £100, I give you a pair of shoes. I then go and buy, with £100, I buy this jacket. And I've got a jacket, and you've got a pair of shoes, where there's a fair exchange taking place, but no profit has been created by this, merely a transfer of money into some other commodity, and then from that commodity, perhaps back to money again. The exchange in the market is, doesn't demonstrate where extra value is coming from, or a, a surplus beyond, or a profit beyond the existing value. Or does it come from unfair exchange? For example, um, if um, I've got a car that everybody agrees in the second car, car dealer industry is worth 750 quid, and I persuade one of you idiots to give me £1,000 for that car, you end up with a £750 worth car, and I end up with £1,000. Clearly, I've made a profit of £250. Is that where the profit comes from? Not over the, looking over the whole of society, because you've made a loss of £250 in the value of the car. That car is not worth £1,000, but only £750. So an unfair exchange has gone on, but all it's done is transfer a certain amount of value from you to me. The overall value of a car worth £750 and £1,000, adding up £1,750, hasn't changed. It's merely that now I've got the £1,000 and you've got the £750. A transfer of value has taken place, but the total amount hasn't changed. So an unfair exchange, cheating, that sort of... Uh, extraction of value from somebody else doesn't change the total value of society and therefore doesn't explain how extra value is created. It's simply a transfer. So it could be that a bank can squeeze you to death on your interest or squeeze a company to death on its interest that it's charging. So it's transferring the value to the bank from the company, but it doesn't mean that the overall value has increased. So it's not a very good explanation of where the extra value coming is coming from, from profit. And what Marx says is that we have to look at what's going on in the process of capital production. And he has a little formula. M, that's money, in the hands of the capitalist. C is what the capitalist buys. And we're starting historically from a certain point, and this is the key point about capitalist production, is that all you guys out there don't have any means of production. You don't have factories, you don't have any uh, other means of production, raw materials, and above all, you don't have much money in which you could do all those things. You have nothing but your ability to come to work and sell your labour in, uh, in a capitalist enterprise. I, on the other hand, as being an extremely successful capitalist, where I got my money from is not very clear. It's back in the murky past of history. Uh, thievery, uh, piracy, imperialism, all sorts of primitive accumulation has created a position where there's a small group of owners of the money and capital and all the rest of you have been driven off your farms and all the other things that you used to own historically your families in the past, forced to migrate, enclosed, God knows what, read the history of, of, uh, of uh, capitalism's early development and you're all with nothing but your ability to sell your labour power and I've got all the money. So I start with N and I can buy my factory, my raw materials, see the commodities and you, your human labour power is part of that commodity. Then I can put everything to, into production and surprise, surprise, I end up with a value of commodities, a completely different commodity than I had before, a new product, it may have been a widget to begin with and ends up as a car, uh, and it's got more value than the original seed. And I can sell that on the market and get more value. Why have I got more value? In the capitalist production, capitalist starts with produce, not with produce, with money. He buys things and services that with that money. Not for him to use personally, but to make a product or deliver service for sale. So everything production is for the market, it's not for personal use. 
on the whole. A capitalist doesn't build his own yacht. Uh, uh, you might buy a yacht if that's what he could afford later on, but his activity is engaged in selling on the market, as we've just seen, by factory, computing, etc. The capitalist therefore must also buy a series of workers. So M becomes C, then C goes to C plus how? And this is what uh, Ragged Trouser Frankfurt, Robert Tressel called the money trick. Uh, here is how it, C gets converted into C plus during the process of production. Let's say the total cost in four hours of production, if your raw materials is three pounds, wear and tear on your machinery and factory and so on is two pounds, and you pay wages to you guys out there of five pounds in four hours. You're worth, that's enough. If I pay you five pounds over four hours of labor, if it's equivalent to four hours of labor, that's enough for you to all go home and manage your families, uh, wife, husband, whatever, relationship with the kids, bring them up, take them to school, get to work next day, uh, etc. The, the, the whole of your existence uh, is that. You've got to provide all those other services. All I do is give you five pounds. And if I give you five pounds, then you will come back the next day and you can go to, go to work. Uh, the total value in four hours then is ten pounds. But here's the trick. I make you work not more than just four hours. I make you work eight hours for five pounds because I signed a contract with you for five pounds and you're able to live on that uh, just about or maybe even reasonably well. Who knows? Depends on the social custom of the country. But I actually get you to work eight hours. Now the total cost after eight hours, raw materials is doubled, an extra four hours of raw materials. Wear and tear is four pounds, an extra uh, doubled of uh, four hours of raw wear and tear. But still only paying you five pounds in wages, because that was agreed in advance, sorry, can't change it now. And the total cost there is 15 pounds. But the value of the labour in eight hours is now 10 pounds. So I now have a commodity plus, which is worth 20 pounds, and it's, it, I can now, uh, six pounds plus four pounds plus the 10 pounds of value that you guys have created for five pounds, and so lo and behold, here is the profit, the money trick. You've been, it's a money trick because I've paid you five pounds and that's a fair exchange, but you have given me more labor in, in labor hours and therefore more value, which I can actually sell on the market for more, uh, 20 pounds, and uh, get a five pound profit. Thus, we have the enigma is solved, the possibility of profits explained, money has been transformed into capital, M, creates commodities, the production process, exploitation of labor. This is the key horrible, dangerous thing about Marx's law of value. Ricardo and the other classic economists recognized that value depended on the amount of labor time and the quantity of labor time expended. They, they thought the labor theory of value was correct. And, but Marx's theory is, uh, well, I'm dead, dead and gone in there. Give me five and I'll catch up on the others. Marx's theory is that it's the exploitation of labor which comes out of the labor theory of value. It's the creation of surplus value. And that's why the labor theory of value cannot be accepted by mainstream economics or by anybody, because it raises the question of exploitation of labor. Yes, we can measure things in labor time, but if surplus value, full profit, comes from the exploitation of labor, that's far too dangerous a thing uh, to mention. So, there are a couple of uh, quick uh, complexities in this theory. What about skilled labor? If you're more skilled than the other person, do you get more money? Well, you may do, and that will be built into the value of your labor power. But overall, we can get a uniform rate across the board to measure the average cost of labor and also the average value that comes out of that. Now, that's a very, here's a really difficult concept in the labor theory of value. And in the next 30 seconds, you're going to have it explained to you. And of course, this will be the puzzle for the rest of the day. But uh, everybody's work is different. Uh, you may have different skills, you may do different things, so with what Marx called that concrete labour. But what happens when everything is put into the process of capitalist production, it's subtracted into the amount of labour value created in one hour or one or period of time. So it doesn't matter what sort of work you do, even what sort of skill you have or what occupation you're in, the capitalist production creates a situation over the whole economy where the hours of work have an, have an average level of skill, give us the quantity of labour time, 
that, uh, that we can measure and use as a measure of value. So labor is both concrete and the individual things you might do, but abstracted in capitalist production in order to tell us and the capitalists what the value is and therefore what they can sell for a profit. Uh, that's a, so, and it's also got to be socially necessary because uh, uh, the abstract labor time requires whether society decides whether, as I will show in this graph, in this picture, whether we, if we built 300 million Rolls Royces, that wouldn't really be socially necessary. Where on the whole, we tend to build lots of Ford Focuses as opposed to Rolls Royces. So there's a decision made, not by us, but by the market, but also a product of how much money each individual has, what, what the class has. Yes, the capitalists will buy a Rolls Royce, but there aren't many of those. So socially necessary drives a sort of direction of, the, of what we produce in the market, and therefore also the amount and where the value uh, is distributed. Now, uh, the, the argument against uh, labor theory of value is that if I was to go down a dirt road in South Africa and I pick up a nice big blue stone and take it home and I find that it's a diamond and it's worth three, three, three million dollars, I haven't put any labor into that whatsoever. I've just picked it off the ground and, that, and the reason it's $3 million is not because of my labour, but because everybody wants a diamond, and it's the scarcity of that diamond. It's that. But then if you look at that, you can see that's already been cut. So there's quite a lot of labour gone into producing it looking like that, but I'm sure a diamond doesn't look like that on the dirt. That's one thing. But even so, maybe that's not enough. Or, most diamonds actually go into industrial production. So then, the process of capital production operates, and the industrial diamond becomes a raw material in you know, the discussion that we have about the development of labor. So it's not just scarce. How about this one? Uh, 450 million pounds for the most expensive painting in the world. How many hours work did that artist do? I forget his name actually. Uh, no, the experts will tell me. How many hours did he put into that to get 450 million pounds? That can't be related to the, to the labor hours involved or something. Wrong. How about Van Gogh's Sunflower so far, it's now worth about $74 million when it, in current money. How many hours did Van Gogh, well, I can tell you that one. He took two days to do that. He knocked him out like nobody's business. <laughs> um, so there's not many labour hours involved in that. By the way, this is the interesting thing about value. Of course, he did absolutely nothing for the two hours, two, two days of work that he put into that. They were regarded as worthless. But doesn't that tell you that the main value is decided not by labour hours, but by what people think is worth having? All I would say, if you look at the bottom line, is that if we go into the capitalist production of Van Gogh's work, which is a print, then the cost of production in value in labour time begins to operate, because it's only 30 quid around the corner or anywhere online at the moment. And that's the cost of production and capitalist process are producing exactly the same as that, only it's not actually the original. But it's a print. I find it good enough, actually, my and, and One minute, okay. So we've got uh, Marx's uh, notes that were just sold uh, last uh, month for $523,000 in a Beijing auction by some Chinese capitalist who bought them to put it to the shelf. And uh, Engels actually went for half that price, sorry, Fred. Uh, again, how much time did it take Marx to write those notes? Probably a bloody long time, but nevertheless, is it in labour hours currently worth $523,000? Obviously not. There's a distortion going on here between labour values and the values of things in a market. Um, how much would you pay for Queen Victoria's toilet seat? <laughs> that came up at the Antiques Roadshow, and uh, uh, I'm not sure how much labour hours went into the production of the toilet seat, but uh, what's the name who runs the show I was asked whether it was clean or not. Uh, <laughs> to see if that difference on the price. And then uh, similarly, what price Queen Victoria's crotchless knickers? Uh, again, these items demonstrate to me the, that capitalism is not an antiques roadshow. But that's what mainstream economics says it is. It's what people think is worth having. And that's deciding the uh, value of things in capitalist production. But it's not the case, is it? This is, these are crudely absurd examples which demonstrate it's not really to do with the auction of what people think on antiques roadshow. So, that's 15 minutes up. Okay, well I'm just going to skip to the very last thing then. There's no change in prices and so on, but 
just want to show you that every market price is, this is a measure empirically between value and prices. The labor, theory, labor value hours measured on one long side, this is done by some economists, there's other ones, and the prices of each individual product in a different sector. If prices and values are more or less the same, therefore not like the MD thread show, then the line should be the direct red, black line right across there. And those points are the different sectors of the economy, and they show that it's pretty close, prices are pretty close to values. So there is the law of value. Labor theory of values, intuitively the best explanation of the prices of commodities and capitalist production. It explains where profit comes from, and it's empirically provable and proven. So that's one in 15. That's a bit of a failure, yeah. isn't it? Go for it. <laughs> I'll reset it now. For yeah, we're going to go. We're going to speed up now, so keep, get, keep concentrated. Okay. Okay. Button press. The second one: law of accumulation. Capitalists are competing. It's not just one capitalist, there's loads of capitalists, as we know, and they're forced into ex in competition, they're forced, they can't stand still, they have to uh, invest, they have to produce, they have to compete against each other to get profits, otherwise they'll be driven out. The law of capitalist accumulation from Marx says that each competition drives each individual capitalist to try and increase the productivity of labour, reduce the cost of production so that they have a competitive advantage over the others. So there's a trend in capitalist production to increase the amount that they invest in technology, computers, anything that will replace human labour, which is the expensive part of the process, to re and increase the productivity of labour in so doing, so that every hour of work that you do is, a, is uh, produces much more than it did before by using the machinery and so on, and that spreads through the whole economy, it reduces the amount that they have to give you in terms of hours of labour relative to how much they're making in profit. So they can boost productivity of labour and profit by going in that direction. But if they do so, then they're investing more in what Marx called constant capital, which is means of production, machine or raw material. Constant capital, machines don't produce any more at value. They've already got value in them produced in the past, and raw materials have got value in them made up for you to use, but they don't actually produce value, new value on their own. So in that sense, they're capital which is constant. That's a key point that Marx makes. So value previously created to produce the machine is now constant and cannot be increased. On the other hand, variable capital, which is us, under the capitalist system, requires human beings going to work, as we saw in the letter to Kuhlman by Marx, and turning on the machines and using up the raw materials. You can ask me about robots later. Uh, only human power, labor power creates new value. To distinguish that, Marx calls the investment in human labor power variable because the value in that type of capital can vary, but it delivers more value. And so, if there's an increase, tendency to increase in investment in machinery and raw materials relative to the amount invested in human labor power, then the key law of accumulation is that as capitalists spend more of their profits on means of production, the ratio of the value of means of production compared to the value of labour power employed, you relative you may still be employing more people, you may even be paying them more, but relative to what's being spent in constant capital, it's falling. And that Marx called this ratio of an increase in constant capital relative to variable capital. He called it the organic composition of capital. I don't be quite sure why, but presumably because it grows uh, organically. Um, uh, and it's a law in capitalist economic expansion that the organic composition of capital will rise. That's, that's the, the key part of the accumulation law. And here's the proof. This is uh, Dumas and Levy, a French economist. They looked at the America's amount of fixed capital per worker. So they measured the total amount of constant capital per worker in dollar terms, and they took out all the inflation and everything. And they started it in the 1880s to now. And you can see that the ratio of constant capital to variable capital has risen historically in the United States. That's empirical proof. So the other aspect of this law is that as it com 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 the organic composition of capital rises, it tends to drive down the demand for you guys to come to work. But in fact, the aim of capitalism is to displace as many of you as possible in order to get uh, productivity up. So there tends to appear an industrial reserve, reserve of a layer of people who don't have work who are ready to work and want to go to work and are not being used. So there's a tendency to increase wealth in the hands of the capitalists, the machines and the factories, 
and to drive down as much as possible the real living conditions of the majority of, of, of the human labour power and in some case, cases leave them in totally unemployed. So we have a dual nature. Capitalism is driving forward the technology in order to get the increased productivity of labour, but at the same time it's trying to displace labour. So you have this contradiction between rising productivity of labour and new technology creating new jobs, but also creating cyclical and uneven unemployment. So we get these cyclical movements, rising wages, then a fall in wages, a rise in employment, but a fall in employment due to this uh, law. So the law creates a growing inequality, as Marx calls it. Not only does it, in the inequality of wealth, uh, between the owners of capital and the rest of us, but also in driving down our ability to do anything but rely upon on the, but going to work and having to use machines and, and always being under the pressure that we could be replaced by machines. And that's extremely the case in this current. Every time there's a technological boom, then it threatens uh, our jobs. And here's the proof again. Uh, we know about back in the days when textile mills replaced uh, weavers and machines. Machine learning now is replacing all the sorts of jobs that we do before. And here is the latest position in the, uh, this was actually produced by the IMF and used by the Bank of England when Mark Carney said he thought Marx's ideas were regaining hold. And he said, look, labor shares falling, uh, technology is driving down the price of, in, of uh, machines so that people are investing in more robots and algorithms and then forcing down the wages. There's a continual pressure upon uh, people to be substituted machines for labour. This is the latest thing that I just saw that if uh, there had been no growth in the computer industry uh, since 1980, so there hadn't been any more computers, then uh, we would have had, uh, there would hardly be any growth in productivity. Computers in fact did grow from 5 to 20 percent of investment. So they were all trying to introduce computers, but the result what's happened was lots of low wage workers lost their jobs. And Yes, some high wage workers in the computer industry and elsewhere gain jobs, but it's a continual battle between the two. And as far as they can say, the, the, the decline in income labour share was down to the fact that it has a massive increase in technology. And finally, see how strongly concentrated under the law of accumulation, the ownership of the means of production, the constant capital, the fixed assets, the own, what capitalists own in capital, we call it capital, relative to workers. Uh, we're just working, and to the increased concentration within the companies themselves. There are now, according to the Swiss Institute of Technology, 147 countries, companies in the whole world who own 40% of all corporate assets in the world. And 1,300 companies own 80% of all the global revenue. So this is their map, and here is top companies that go out and control through an interconnected shareholding system all the other companies in the system, I forget how many, many they included in it, it's a great number. So that was a, they looked at all the shareholdings of different companies and came up to that. So, what the law of accumulation is telling us is that um, C over V rises over time, this means increased centralization and concentration of capital, it creates a reserve army of labor and a technological unemployment, and that will vary according to the ability of the workers to fight that and the, the strength of the growth of productivity in the capitalist economy. So, this law can also be empirically verified, as I've shown in many studies. There we go. That's that one. How was that? Oh, done in 7.48. That's more like it. <laughs> now we're going for it. Final run. So this is the final one, a boring old one that I'm always going on about. Uh, so, here's the final law, which brings together the other two laws to produce this law. That's the important thing. That the first two laws are necessary in order to uh, justify this one. So, first of all, Marx says in Grundrisse, for those who don't know, that's Marx's scrutiny notes, which now go for $523,000 per page. Uh, he wrote uh, Grundrisse, his notes for capital, and he said, in every respect, this is the most important law of political economy and the most essential for us to understand what's going on. And it's the most important law from the historical point. Well, to see how capital, where capital is coming from, where it's going. And some more, which despite its simplicity, so he claims, uh, has never before been grasped and is even less consciously articulated. So here is the simple formula S over C plus V is the rate of profit formula. Capitalist starts with money to invest in, the means of production, 
fixed capital, raw materials, circulating capital. We've just dealt with this in the past two sessions. That we call constant capital. And you need employees a labor force, you lot, to produce the quantities, pays you wages, doesn't pay you as much in wages as the value he gets out of you in a day's work or a year's work or whatever it is. So it's variable capital. And the extra that he gets out of you, that unpaid labor he gets in the process of production out of you, uh, that he can sell any commodity, is called the surplus value. So those are the three parts of the formula. Now, we, to remind ourselves, the first two laws motion lead to the third law. The first law says that only labor creates value. The second law says the capitalists will accumulate over time and it will take the form of a faster rise in, in the means of production relative to how much is invested in the value of labor power. So there's a rising organic composition of capital. So only labor creates value and there's a rising organic composition of capital. Those are two laws, provable and proven, which inevitably lead to Marx's law of profitability. Uh, and here's the Cranfield Institute bit, which I pinched from them. Uh, so you have the rate of profit, ROP, S surplus value over constant capital plus variable capital gives you the rate of profit. And here's the trick, as we say. If we divide the value of labor, V, or labor power, into that equation, so if I divide S by V, I'll get S over V. If I divide C by V, I get C over V. If I divide V by V, I'll get 1. It's uh, elementary algebra, I don't love it anymore. Uh, so, what is the point of doing that? Well, because it exposes a certain thing. It exposes that what will determine whether the rate of profit is going to fall or not is whether that grows faster than that. And what is that on the top line? That is surplus value over variable capital, or the value of labor power, is the rate of exploitation, of how much I can exploit. And what is this? This is the second law. The, the organic composition of capital. So the organic composition of capital has to rise faster than the ability to exploit you, otherwise the rate of profit won't fall. And Marx's second law says that the organic composition of capital will rise. So the question really is, does the rate of profit be rate of profit will fall if C over V rises faster than S over V? The organic composition rises faster than the rate of exploitation of surplus value. And that's the general tendency in, as put forward in the second law. It will rise faster, but there are times when the S over V rises faster. This is a counter tendency. So that's why it's a tendency. It's a tendency for the rate of profit to fall because this rises faster over that as a tendency, but there are times when it does not, and the counter tendency operates. The two counter tendencies, the tendency I've just described is organic composition of capital outstripping the rate of exploitation. The other one is that the rate of surplus value rises higher. But the other one is, what happens if things get so cheap, computers get so cheap, that actually C over V falls, doesn't it? So the organic composition of capital, the second law of That's another cast of tendency that Marx points out. So, some people argue so there's a long-term tendency for the rate of profit to fall, Mark is arguing that C over V will outstrip the ability of S over V to rise as a result of the use of the machine. So the rate of profit will fall over the long term. But it will also create, in my view, a series of periodic crises and slumps which have to be corrected by it. The slump necessitates the process of reducing all of the cost of production and therefore creating a new higher rate of profit. Now, uh, let me just say the first slide, first argument, long-term secular tendency, half of Marxist economists, economists say that that is the law. The other half say the second bit is the law. So the law causes periodic crises. The other half said no it doesn't, it causes a long-term secular fall and has nothing to do with crises. And the ones that say it has to do with crises, some of them say well it's not, it hasn't got a long-term secular fall. It's just a crisis, stuff like that. So the law is like, produces a result like that. The other one says, no, it produces a result like that. I say it produces both. Um, I don't think it's, it has to be one or the other. And here is my continual figure produced every year, ad nauseam, the world rate of profit pinched from Esteban Maito, I always have to mention him, the Argentine young economist who's sitting in the bowels of the uh, finance department of Argentina's uh, Ministry of Finance, 
where in the evenings, when it's not so hot, he does this sort of work. And uh, Michael Roberts cavalierly takes his ideas and presents them in a way in, across Europe while Esteban remains locked in darkness. <laughs> <laughs> However, we hope to present Esteban's ideas in the new book in October and uh, reverse this process of, of Roberts taking all the credit. Uh, so here we see a secular form in the Reign of Prophet, proven, but counter tendencies in the Reign of Prophet. It doesn't fall in a straight line, and there are periods after a, perhaps a long depression, a situation of war, where there's sharp rise in the Reign of Prophet. So it's both cyclical and secular. They have recurring crises. The counter tendencies transform the breakdown into a temporary crisis, so that the accumulation process is not something continuous. That takes the form of periodic cycles. You done. Six fifty-five. Yes, I basically agree with the whole of the presentation. But uh, I wonder if uh, comrades are aware that within Marxism there is disagreement even about the labour theory of value. Uh, so, for example, in the Marx and Philosophy Society, which I'm a member of, there were about half of the people in the Marx and Philosophy Society who think that exchange value is more fundamental than use value. And what they say is, exchange value, yes, it's it is basically an accounting process, but without that accounting process, it would not be possible for production to take place and for use value to occur. So, uh, when, socialists, when the socialist members of the Marx and Philosophy Society say to them, yes, but we want to move from a, a state in which, it's, uh, in which uh, abstract labour dominates over concrete labour, we want to move to uh, an economy in which uh, concrete labour dominates, uh, they, they will say, well, you can't have that because it means that you're abandoning the accounting process which makes the whole process of production possible. So I, I, I'm just reporting that. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's a good argument, uh, but I don't know whether Michael has anything to say about that. Okay, thanks for being Sorry, yeah. Oh, well, I'll take you as you're here. Sorry. Yes, you're next. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> yeah. uh, what I was going, how come if unemployment is claimed to be at an all time low, why are wages are falling rather than rising? Okay, nice. Can I just have another, the hands up of people who wanted to speak, just to make sure I've got them? Yeah. And have a think, anybody else, if I can. Falling and so on, which I found very useful. 
And then there's also a great bit you've got there where you, you look at uh, attempted criticisms of Marx. And uh, again, I found that really useful in trying, trying to anticipate some of the questions that I might get when I did my talk. Uh, and uh, just one thing which I thought was really good was uh, obviously post 2008, the neoliberal, you know, purist classical Marxist view, a uh, classical uh, economy view is massively under attack. So I think that the Keynesian alternative is something that I think we're more likely to be arguing with, certainly in terms of sort of John McDonnell and the possible future Corbyn government and so on. And I thought you were very good about that. I mean, I love that thing which I've not come across where you quote uh, Keynes in 1930 or 31 gave a lecture at Cambridge, which was really an attempt to sort of stop the undergraduates that you've been with running off to embrace Marxist economics post the 1929 crash. And you quote Keynes saying, look, I know it looks bad now, but I'm sure that in 50 years' time we'll be talking about people only working 15 hours a week because of new technology. You said that in 1931, now 50 years later was 1981, Margaret Thatcher was putting 3 million people out of work. So Keynes was very, very wrong. And I, I really found it interesting the way that you said that, uh, you know, Keynes starts his analysis of the economy by talking about demand, what do people want? And you say that Marx actually said, no, 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 no. We start with actually, why does production take place in the first place? And that is because capitalists want to make a profit. And actually, that's what we get rammed down our throats all the time as socialists, isn't it? Oh, you don't understand that somebody's got to make a profit. But when they actually want to try and defend it at an intellectual level, yes. they go to Keynes and talk about all of, you know, aggregate demand and so on. So I thought your book was absolutely fantastic. I found it really useful, and I really do urge people to buy it. Michael has not planted me to come up here and say this, by the way. I just thought it was a really excellent introduction. Two things. First of all, uh, Alex Kalinikos in his book on imperialism mentions the fact that uh, at the very end of the third volume of Capital, Engels puts the 30 page addendum and says that the law of value is only of historical interest, which I think is completely wrong, and Alex also thinks it's an interesting point. Uh, and then the question I have about skilled labor is uh, mentioned it very quickly, that I have is also controversy. Just feeling, even if Martin doesn't go into much detail, it seems quite obvious that there is such a thing as skilled labour, which actually does add more value, because it doesn't add more value, it's some value which is already in him, which he just refers to, to the product in some way or other. And the fact that skilled labour is, is replaced by machines and so on actually proves it, because the, the campus have a even greater interest to reduce the costs of this <coughs> Okay, so the woman in the picture, and then I've seen the team person after that, so I have lost you there. Um, okay, I'll turn to you for the next. Um, well, I've got um, a question about um, Michael Lieberwitz's contribution um, in Beyond Capital, yeah. um, because he hones in on Chapter 12 of Volume 1, and Basically, I, if I've not understood him correctly, that you can't just, that why does Marx make the assumption that the uh, benefits of increasing productivity actually go to capital as opposed to, to labour? Where is the proof that actually the ratio of variable capital to constant capital would change and that you know, wages will go down? And, um, and he uses this. It's part of a, another debate, but he uses this as an argument that, that Marx underestimates um, struggle at the point of production over wages and he reduces workers to being passive in capital, which is the centrepiece of his argument. Um, but actually, chapter 12 is very condensed, and you talked about competition as being the key reason to the introduction of productivity. And the implicit in that is the replacement of workers by um, cost and capital, by machinery, and therefore the, the component of the percentage of variable capital will go down, as I understand it. But I'd like your take on it if it more would. Thank you. Well,
more than I'm going to have to go back to Only 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've really been walking around a bit. Um, I would just like to say that um, this is an incredibly complex system and uh, the rate of profit, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall in the rate of profit equation itself um, is actually really difficult to kind of wrap your head around in, in, in a sense. Um, and like I remember my maths lecturers telling me to uh, sit in a dark room and think about it for hours and end, and I'll certainly end up doing that. Um, but I'll, um, I, I'd like to, uh, I, I would like to read your book. I, I would also like to recommend Joseph Gennaro's book that's at the back, which uh, is, looks a bit shorter, um, but it's an absolutely fantastic introduction. And, um, and uh, having read it, um, and I'd also like to thank you for um, your help with, um, I, I, I read your blog when I was doing my meeting on Bitcoin and that sort of thing. Um, and understanding things, uh, the way currency and money works um, with the capitalist system, which I think is where Marx starts with uh, in Capital Platform stuff about value. And I think that is an incredibly um, valuable uh, contribution to our understanding of, uh, of the economy. Um, I'd just like to ask one more question as well. Um, as a mathematician, and a pure mathematician, I sometimes find it quite difficult to understand proofs and, and that are just using examples and things like that. Um, so I wonder if there are, you have any book recommendations that um, obviously use the, uh, the context of the real world to found, found uh, the judgments on capitalism, but then take that and, and prove things without using like, oh well the, the only proof we need is the evidence in the real world. Okay. Um, or, or, or you can cut that bit out entirely, that's, that's something that would be helpful for me personally. But, thanks. <laughs> Yes, um, why, why is that just a simple question, the slide off the wall? So the slab assignment sounds is it's a simple question. Um, and your, on your last slide, so you showed the, uh, the, the world economy declining over the, from 1969 right the way through to... The main uh, Yes, yeah, the main um, But the two periods, uh, 1949 and 1945, uh, the, you would have expected a much sharp drop in terms of the, uh, the amount of destruction that took place in the cosmic uh, chaos, etc. Et yeah, I wonder if you could explain why, uh, why it doesn't appear that there is a more catastrophic drop in those two periods because obviously uh, there are two most destructive periods in, uh, in uh, world history. Yeah. Thank you. And the comment that we've followed by Hi, I just wanted to say that you're like while you were speaking, I, I, I'm maybe a little sad, but I had, actually had a small adrenaline rush while you were saying it. It's not that much. <laughs> it's not that much. It is. It is. Um, I wanted to ask a tiny, tiny, like, selfish question because, like, I'm going into medicine, like, hopefully next year. So I was wondering how that fits into like skilled, unskilled labour and things like that. Very skilled. Okay. Any other hands up? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, uh, for that public presentation. I'm just wondering what you think about uh, this new idea, uh, very popular among millennials, called uh, universal basic income, or basic income as a way of redistributing wealth. Uh, it's a very popular idea amongst the millennial generation youngsters. I don't know if you know, but it's about uh, streamlining all the benefit payments and welfare state into one single payment for everybody, regardless of income, regardless of their social status. Uh, massive redistribution of wealth from the top earners from the top 1% or 0.1% uh, to fund such an income which gives everybody uh, the minimum amount of money required for them to live. So I think that this payment uh, comes with their food, bills, housing, rent, uh, transport, etc. etc. 
and uh, this is a very popular idea people are talking about. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Um, so Simple question number two. Uh, um, could you get into the specificities of how um, the different forms in which a crisis uh, devaluates uh, with the cost in capital? I know uh, Joseph Gennaro speaks in his uh, latest uh, IS article mainly about destruction. Uh, and I was wondering if you could get into this, you know, more specificities of other ways in which, uh, in which crisis um, devaluates cost yeah. capital. Blue here, and Paul Hiding. And then we're going to wrap it up so that you have plenty of time for all these questions. Um, first of all, a huge thank you to Hong Kong because we are all really here to talk about this. So, we're following your take on the world. So, I'm awake when you are, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, my question is one about the uh, distribution of value because, you know, according to Marx's theory, we start from the and then there are surface value that get redistributed across the system so that we actually get a really lopsided view of the world that we just see from the service. Yep. But then it also creates a huge, I think, difference in perhaps consciousness or lifestyle among people in different parts of the world where there is such a division of labor. For, for example, if we're just saying that it's a distribution of value towards, say, the financial system that helps, you know, oil the system, and then that create the, the absolute amount of value is actually enough to support say lawyers and also a huge class of service workers, class in the office who lives in an absolutely different world from those who are actually producing value. And I'm wondering if it creates a huge problem in, in say creating solidarity, etc. Especially given that we're living in such a different world compared to those who are producing value in other this. Thank you, Michael. I find your talk absolutely fascinating. I always come back every year. Uh, you know, I'm very clear, and I subscribe to your blog as well, which I find, you know, I'm not an artist of colours, but I do find it very enlightening and very accessible, you know, uh, to some sort of economics. I wanted to come back to what Trask is time, actually. Yes. Because, you know, looking at the room, um, most people in the room, probably would be working in some sort of manufacture that certainly where I'm from in South Wales, I would be either down the head or working in some sort of steel works. So looking at the charts, 75% of manufacturing or, um, was in 1920 and the rest was, was surfaces, 25%. Now we're looking at 2018. It's the completely other way around. So you know the tendency to rate of profit to fall uh, and the organic composition of capital certainly you know, refutes Marxist and your uh, analysis and territory. But how much can this, in the manufacturing area, you know, 15% even less, so how can this accrue, you know, in the next 15, 20 years? You know, how, where is manufacturing good? You talk about robots, and obviously that's his dead labour and living, <coughs> so who's going to do the jobs? If that makes sense. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so our final Firstly, just on the question of competition and what it imposes, it imposes on campus class a need to press wages down as low as possible and intensify work as high as possible. But there are limits to what you can do for the workforce in those respects. After we resist, up to a point, uh, the lowering of wages, and there's, there's a point below which wages can't go, you don't get the workforce back in the morning because they haven't got the, uh, the food and the housing and what have you. And similarly, in terms of intensification, so there's a constant drive under competition to try and raise productivity through technological innovation. That's the expansion of the constant capital side that uh, Michael has talked about, which then has the implication, whilst it's logical for each capitalist to innovate and to raise productivity in this way, over the system as a whole, it lowers the rate of profit and, uh, that, uh, that uh, they need in order to keep the system healthy and, and expanded. So what's logical for each individual capitalist becomes, as it were, irrational uh, uh, for the system uh, as a whole. So just quickly on the destruction, the evaluation of capital. Crises are ways in which the system tries to rectify itself, if you like, through destruction, devaluation. It can be physical destruction. Factories close down. In wars, factories are destroyed. Wars being precipitated by that same process of, of competition. There's also the devaluation when 
companies go bankrupt and their assets can be bought up cheaply. This kind of devaluation that you see when there's a big collapse in stock values and so forth. There are different ways in which the devaluation destruction process works. But the process is then uh, fit, as it were, for the surviving capitals to come back in and to try and expand again. There's something I just wanted, last thing I want to raise very quickly, and that is that uh, the comment you said, look, we've got these abstract mathematical, mathematical models which show these possibilities, but what about the relevance of the empirical uh, context in which they develop? One of the things that we've seen over the 20th century is the growth in the size of states and the role of states in the regulation, spending, and so forth. And I think that's an important factor in the way in which crises can sometimes be prevented from developing further than they might in a highly destructive way, but then in the way in which the system then becomes somewhat trapped because they can't clear out the excess capital to the degree they need in order to regenerate the system on, on an expanding basis. Thank everybody for uh, providing the information for three volumes of Carol. Um, and I'll not be able to give the answers in ten minutes to all the questions presented. Um, deep in the philosophy debate of the philosophy department, or wherever it is, the philosophy club, where the philosophers uh, criticise the value of the law of value and saying, well, this is an argument we also get amongst academic economists, and this is where I usually get into trouble. But there's a a group of Marxist economists, and it seems these philosophers that uh, was being talked about in the first question had the same view. That, uh, I'd like to quickly show, they argue that value comes only when things are sold. If things aren't sold, there's no value. Okay? So therefore, it's the exchange value that creates the value, not the process of production by workers. You, only, you don't create any value unless the capitalist sells it. So that sounds a pretty logical argument. So the philosophers then turn the whole thing of the theory of value around the other way and says that value is determined by the market and not by the exploitation of the labor force. Marx says, no, no, no. Let's abstract from the market first. Then we can see in the very first uh, one I've got here, if I can get back to it, the one that was the longest. Marx's very first. Um, <coughs> he says, every child knows that if we all cease to work, then there'll be no value. Nothing's produced. The market will be relevant unless human beings work. That's a fundamental point. He said, yes, then the science is how to demonstrate how the law of value operates in the capitalist thing. So if it's correct that Engels said, well, the law of value operates in all societies. Well, in a way, what he meant was that human labour creates things. If there's no production of human labour, nothing gets created. But the thing about the capitalist system production is that it creates value in two forms. Use value, things that we need, and things that can be sold on the market for a profit. So within each commodity, because of capitalist production, those two forms of value are embodied in the value of the commodity. What the philosophers are saying is, that is the exchange value and the accountants. Use value is irrelevant. Well, that's just nonsense, isn't it? Because unless it, unless it actually is useful to anybody, then it won't be produced. It can't just be the profit. It can't just be an accounting thing. That's what capitalists say. They say everything, just look at the market, just look at my prices, just look at my sales. No, 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 no. But we want to know what's going on underneath. Why these things are being, are they socially necessary? Are they being, how are they being produced? And what is the process of production? And that's the dangerous thing. The law of value creates an explanation. There's an exploitation going on. Engels said there's exploitation throughout all societies. Yes. But the form of explanation, precisely how the law of value asserts itself, is what we need to understand in the process of capitalist production. And there are a number of Marxist economists who say that value is only created when we get to the market. The value form of theorists, of which there are a number who are very prominent, much more prominent. And I spend occasional sly attacks upon them. Uh, uh, but it's not the most important thing to worry about. What well, academics think that only value is created because it's sold. I mean, I don't really want to get out to that debate, and I've just wasted five minutes on it. However, there's an indicator that that sort of debate goes on amongst academic things. It's really a, a process of try not recognizing that um, the law of value is a process of exploitation of human labor in capitalist production. It's the key. 
dangerous point that Marx brings out uh, an old labour theory of value. Some people say Marx didn't have, uh, David Harvey said Marx doesn't have a labour theory of value. In a way, David Harvey's right. It's not a labour theory of value that just everything is measured in labour dollars. It's more than that. It's a value theory which just says that everything is produced through the exploitation of workers, the creation of unpaid labour compared to paid labour, and that the process of, yes, you can measure everything in labour hours, but some of that is surplus value that workers have not received in their wages and has been embodied in the commodity and so on. And that's what makes it a very distinctive form of a capitalist production. Robert Tressel, which I've got at the back of my little book, you have the whole thing, little Robert Tressel's money trick, which explains the process by which you end up with nothing and either capitalists end up with everything over and over in the process of production, and yet it all seems to be a fair exchange. It's a clever thing done by uh, an educated painter. He wasn't a steel worker, but he was a painter. Uh, and and he, he explains that and that process. And he also deals with one of the other questions in the class consciousness of the workers in that process. Because they fail to understand the money trick, uh, because most of us don't, don't understand that, we think we get a, well, maybe we don't get a fair deal, but we get a wage. And, and that process means that we don't miss out on the role of the exploitation that is going on here and how the division between the majority and the very small minority begins to develop. Uh, why, do, why is unemployment so low and wa uh, wages so low? Well, it, it is a bit of a puzzle at the moment amongst many capitalist economists, but most of this employment is in really terrible jobs. Very low paid jobs, precarious jobs. This is the worst sort of precariousness that we've seen for some time. It's a process partly of the technology we talked about in the second law, and partly, I would argue, in the process that capitalism is unable to develop a sufficiently healthy and sustained growth rate, which enables it to provide decent wages for everybody. I was just looking at the figures of Japan today. Japan has a record low unemployment. Record low. It has no progress in real wages for 10 years. Japanese workers have gained nothing in real wages. They go to work, they, they, more of them are getting a job, mainly it's females for the first time in Japan being employed, basically to take old people like me from one taxi station to another and to the hospital. Uh, and that's, these jobs are being paid for nothing. They get nothing, virtually nothing for these jobs. Anybody who goes around London and uh, decides to go into a restaurant if they can afford it, realises the sort of level of uh, income that are being earned by the whole range of uh, service workers. Yes, many workers are on the unproductive sector. It's a myth between manufacturing and services. S services is the a, is a capitalist economics definition. If you look in the services bit, there's many productive workers uh, in the services sector. Workers who produce a service, a barista at uh, Starbucks, in my opinion, is a productive worker. Delivering some uh, product for you uh, for the profit for the capitalists and doing the, and expending human labour power. The manager of the, of the range of Starbucks is a different, he's an unproductive worker. He's made sure that everything else, the productive workers are working properly. He's unproductive. He might be necessary to the capitalist, otherwise the thing doesn't work properly and uh, the things, things go to pieces. But nevertheless, he is unproductive. He doesn't create any more value. He merely tries to make sure that the productive workers do so. Much bigger way of looking at it, think of the most important, I mean, unproductive workers are only unproductive to capitalism. It doesn't mean to say that they're not important for our society. All the workers in education, in the health service, in, the, in all the ranges of public services, the, these people are unproductive. As far as capitalists are concerned, in a way, that they would like to get rid of them. Unfortunately, they're, they're, they're reasonably necessary both to reproduce labour power so that you're healthy enough to go out and educated enough to provide profit, but we'd like to keep it to the very bare minimum if we can, and if there's any opportunity to slash it back, we'd love to do so. Uh, of course, sometimes we, we cut our own nose to do that and we find that we don't have skilled staff and we like in the UK go down a complete hole compared to those that do. So there, there is con this continual battle, but those are unproductive workers, they're only unproductive to to the capitalist system, not to, the, to a future socialist system, they're absolutely vital part of the process. We need to expand unproductive workers in a socialist system, it would be a different. We'd be producing the socially necessary services that we require. Which brings me briefly to the point about universal basic income. There's, because we're in a capitalist society, there's a desperate desire amongst certain people 
but we need to, to say this. Robots are coming, everybody's going to be wiped out of jobs. We need to fight for a universal income, whether you're in a job or not, if you, even if the robots are taking you out. That sounds a good principle, a good idea, but is it the way that is the best way to deal with it? First of all, most people advocate those who are seriously getting around to a universal basic income system, like in Finland and elsewhere, what they've done is replace the whole welfare state with it. So there's no real improvement in the level of income for the people receiving this. It's really a way of another neoliberal way of introducing a cut in, in, the, in the conditions of public services. Where it's a more socialist way, it's not going to be implemented because the cost is huge to capital. They wouldn't be prepared to agree to that. I always think that it's also wrong, really, from the point of view of our strategy to get socialism. The, the law of value tells us that the most important thing is to expand use values in a social society and eventually reduce exchange values. Now, it, that can only be, be done by the complete transformation of capitalism into a socialist economy, or is an economy run by the working class and a planned economy. But what does that mean? Now, it, the concept is that we want to increase services and products free at the point of use. So we want not just a uh, health service free, why can't we have free transport? It's happening in Germany, even under capitalism, in medicines. Why can't we have free energy, free phones? All these basic services that public services that people need should be free. How would we pay for that? Because the production will mean that we switch our resources and values to producing use values that are free and reduce the amount that we spend on trident and other things and or, or just on capitalist production for profit and the private sector. It's a complete transformation. So in my view, universal basic income is not as good as universal basic services, which would be my slogan. Let's have basic services free at the point of production, not just health service, but eventually food, basic food. You go into Tesco's, or Amazon sends it to you, and it's free. Why? Because the production system has organized itself in that way. We gradually remove uh, a whole layer of things that would, that would dramatically raise living standards uh, for the majority. So that's a different way of looking at it. Uh, Michael Leibovitz is a long-standing Marxist economist from Western Canada. Um, he's even older than me, uh, so he's very venerable and uh, uh, important. Uh, but I don't agree with him at this point. In this point, he claims that Marx says that uh, he has an iron law of wages, that you can't get wages up. As soon as capitalism expands and workers try to get wages up, then capitalism drives them down or it has a crash. Uh, and that there, therefore, uh, there's an iron law of wages. Well, I don't think he denies the rate of profit as being relevant to crises. He says that, prove to me that there's a rising organic composition of capital. Uh, there is, which I, I gave you the Duminelle of Levy's figures, and there are lots of others. He says, prove to me that. Prove to me that goes up. Well, okay, I think it goes up. <laughs> so there is a rising composition of capital. So the question between wages and profits is a class struggle, isn't it? Every day there's a class struggle over how, how the surplus value created by the workers is to be, well, the value created by the workers is to be distributed between the workers and the capitalists. Every day there's a battle. You're paid a wage, uh, the surplus value goes to the capitalist. If you can get the wage up, there's less surplus value. So the, worker, the capitalists think, okay, well, I'm going to get another machine and get rid of you bastards and get a, a new computer in or an algorithm. In my case, in the economist's world, they're going to have algorithms. So, uh, they've already started it. Uh, they did the test that they used. They got this top economist to write an article on some economic matter, and they got a robot to write the article, and they sent it to everybody. And uh, everybody was asked which is the top economist and which is the robot's article, and the majority said it was the robot's article that was the best. Uh, this is the end of uh, my life as I know. <laughs> the other one was, which I have to tell you, is a practical experience in a hedge fund. Uh, the, you know, the hedge fund is it's where people take uh, banks' money, which they pinch from us, 
and they recirculate it by doing lots of speculating, going long and short, whatever that might mean to you. Basically, they say, if an economy is going down the chute, like Argentina, let's slam in all our money, betting it will go down further, and we can make a billion, like uh, what Soros did on the British pound back in the 1990s. So this is hedge fund business. So every week, they sit down and decide whether they're going to sell the dollar or buy the dollar. Well, there's one hedge fund, they've got six guys, they're all in Hawaiian shirts and shorts, by the way, in America. Uh, and they sit down and say, is, it, is, the, is the dollar going to go up? So they all say, well, I think it is. The other one says, no. So what's that? Three to two. And then they press the button. And the algorithm comes up and says, sell or buy. So they have one algorithm has as much vote as the other five hedge fund managers. And that's where the process is going. We're going to see a lot more of this. The end of, the end of, uh, of jobs as I know it. Uh, and there are lots of other jobs are threatened by this process. And this process, as we see in the second law, is contradictory. It can also create new jobs. They said when, when they introduced automatic tenant machines, it was going to wipe out bank branches and bank clubs. Well, in fact, what it did was, yes, it did wipe out a lot of bank clubs, but it actually there were a lot more branches, and bank and clubs and other things did a lot less. Did lots of other things, rather than just doing, uh, handing out money at the counter. So sometimes technology creates a whole new sector, a whole new industry. Well, yes, we've seen it. Whereas before you could work like Robert Tressel, slaving away 12 hours a day with lead paint in a room and occasionally asking the other workers whether they agree with the money trick or not. Or you can go to Amazon and work 12 hours a day uh, and be told to be, don't come in next day until we call you and here's your wages, but we've deducted the bit where you didn't actually, you seem to be a bit asleep, so we've taken that off. Uh, uh, so things have improved. Uh, all they've changed, it depends on how you see uh, the, the way it is. But, so, so we've got a situation in the three laws, where I think that, that they give us a basic idea of what, the, what uh, Marx is saying about the capitalist economy and its processes. The law of value being the most important one, only human labor creates value, but in a certain way in capitalist production, and capitalist production leads to an increasing investment in machinery, raw materials, constant capital over labour, uh, relatively. I don't mean to say that unemployment doesn't go up. And so you get a rising organic composition of capital. And those two together mean that it's a tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Yes, as the rate of profit falls, it will cause a crisis in profits. And what the crisis is for is precisely to stop the rate of profit falling anymore. And uh, so that yeah, what happens in these periods, if you can see the rate of profit rise in countries, what the, the question is, is actually in the wars when the rate of profit rises. Because there's a destruction of physical capital in the case of the, the Second World War in Europe, but also a devaluation of civil capital, civilian capital in, in the US. Uh, and all the savings of the workers went into the military production. The capitalists can produce tanks and all those. What? They can make a huge profit. It's a huge rise in profitability in both the wars, actually, the First World War and the Second World War. And after the Second World War, we had a period called the Golden Age where the rate of profit remained relatively high because of the, the whole of Europe and Japan and Asia had new technology and piles of you willing to work for virtually nothing. It was a fantastic Golden Age for capitalism. And actually, workers also gained a bit. They gained a bit of strength in the unions for a period of time. But then eventually the law says the rate of profit operates in a dramatic way. This is world. This is not just the UK, this is the world. Crashes down over a period of 15, 20 years. And in that period, there's a massive class struggle. This is, this is my golden age of the struggle when I was a youngster like, well, not many of you Yeah, time's up. Uh, and so that period is a massive class struggle when the profitability is falling, but the workers are reasonably strong and they can fight. But then they were defeated. And now we're in this long depression. See you this afternoon. <laughs>